שצריך לתחום את Right, hello. Rachel, are you there? I am, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that seems to be working. It says we're live on YouTube. Would so. you like, no, can't hear. Oh, Rachel? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, sorry. Yes, I just Brilliant. haven't undone a mute. So, uh, <laughs> right, as, as far as I know, we're now live streaming. So, um, right, well, Welcome everybody to um, what is the last of this season's um, talks from Books and Field Club. Um, I'd like to welcome particularly new members. Um, I think we've got Penny and Peter and we've also got um, JJ Petch, who's um, our youngest uh, member. Um, so, um, and I'm sorry if I haven't mentioned other people who are also new, um, but a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, tonight's talk, um, I think, is going to be a fantastic talk from Rachel Everett um, and um, a really nice way of, of rounding um, our season of talks off as, as we come back to the Peak Districts, because obviously we've, we've roamed over various parts of the world, um, but we're now back to the Peak District for our final talk. Um, Rachel will talk for about 50 minutes um, and then be very happy to take um, questions and answers. Um, and uh, after that, we will have a short break and then we go on to our AGM, which obviously everyone is also um, very, very welcome to come to. We will keep it short and sweet, um, but uh, you're very welcome and it will continue on, on the same link. Um, uh, I, I don't think that there's too much more for me to say other than um, we first met Rachel because we got in touch with her because we thought that what they were doing at Sin Art Field sounded really exciting and so we wanted to go and have a nosy. Um, and I got in touch with Rachel and um, her and her husband were incredibly generous with their time and said, yes, of course, come up, we'll show you around. Um, and they spent a good couple of hours showing us around the farm, which was probably a year or so ago, certainly before lockdown. Um, and um, it looked as though it was going to be fascinating, looked as though it was going to be a very big job indeed. Uh, and then we happened to go back just recently because we helped to do a little bit of, um, of the hedge planting there. And uh, I was talking to Rachel yesterday, and one of the things that really struck me was the dynamism. Um, that they are taking this place and, and they're, they're not doing it by heart. They are going for it big time in the changes that they're making. Um, and it is absolutely wonderful to see um, and all the things that, that are happening and um, every, every bit of nature that, that's returning already. Um, so really, I just wanted to say to Rachel, thank you so much for, um, for uh, coming forward to give us a talk tonight. Um, and I hope everybody finds it just as fascinating as we do. Um, so with no more ado than that, um, I don't think there's anything else I should say. I think I should just shut up um, and pass over to Rachel. So Rachel, please entertain us. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to um, share my screen. So I'll bring my slides up. Um, so hopefully now you can, you can all see that. Rachel, is that showing okay from your side? Yeah. Brilliant, fantastic. So, well, thank you very much indeed for, um, for joining this talk tonight and giving up your Saturday night to hear me speak. Um, I do appreciate there's not, not much else on offer on Saturday nights these days, but uh, thank you for choosing me ahead of any other talk or, or uh, watching event that you, you could have joined. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Rachel, and, and as of around a year ago, I can say now that I am a farmer and a land manager, and I'm also a mum to two, and I've had a, about a 16-year career in the internet, internet technology companies. So I'm going to be talking really about how I came to be doing this, so what the motives are, um, why we're doing it, what we're doing, and sort of how far we've got. Um, it very much is the start of a journey. Um, we are very early in terms of what we're trying to do. So I'm not presenting this as a done deal, um, but rather a sort of set of hypotheses and sort of where we are along that. 
So hopefully there's uh, something to take away from that. But I would encourage you to kind of stay in touch with what we're doing because it will change. We will iterate. We will learn as we go along. And I think that's part of it is kind of being open minded to um, uh, to new information and and uh, very much kind of learning as we go. I thought it's also quite significant, and I didn't realise this when Rachel and I agreed to do this talk, that today is, uh, is actually the UN's uh, first global rewilding day. Um, and it's probably pretty significant that it's, it's the first of this type of, of global day, just showing some movement and sort of momentum behind the movement, really. Um, it also falls on the, uh, the spring equinox. And I'm coming to realise spending more time actually on the lands that uh, times like this are, are particularly significant. So it feels like a really good time to be kind of reporting back and sort of sharing where we're up to. So I'm going to start really with a bit of background to myself. Um, this picture here is, um, is something that I was very lucky to grow up with. Uh, this is the view from our back garden and indeed a similar view from my bedroom window. Um, it's in Cheshire, and if you uh, know your castles, you might recognise that the one on the right is Beeston Castle, and the one in the distance on the left is Peckerton Castle. And sort of surrounding that, so it's fairly typical British farmland. So although it gives the impression of being quite undulating here, actually, Cheshire is very flat. There's a lot of arable farming, there's a lot of beef and dairy farming, and there's an awful lot of horse paddocks as well. And although I didn't grow up on a farm, I was really lucky um, to be able to spend a lot of time. I had friends who did grow up on farms and we spent a lot of time playing in barns and on the field margins, making dens and so on. And I think it's really relevant because that kind of um, upbringing in a rural setting and that time just spent contemplating and taking in nature and all these sort of subconscious observations, um, I think they really stay with you. And I've certainly found a really strong desire to live rurally, um, to bring my children up rurally, but also to really connect in a, in a deeper way with nature. Um, that might not be apparent because uh, my career choices were actually to enter the digital world. Um, so I, I studied engineering at university. And when I came out of my degree, I was very much at a time when the internet was really starting to boom. There were lots of opportunities to create websites and create services and um, subsequently uh, to offer those through apps. Um, and so uh, a friend and I from university started uh, an internet company um, and we were lucky enough to sell that company to a larger internet startup um, where I worked for uh, just over seven years. Uh, and during the time that I was there, um, that company, which is called Skyscanner, um, it grew to be one of the UK's um, internet unicorns. Um, so it was bought out by a, a, the biggest Chinese um, uh, travel agency. And I was very lucky because I had shares in that organization. Um, and that meant um, for the first time really ever, I, it, it, certainly in my life and, and something I hadn't really predicted happening, um, I suddenly was found with uh, the opportunity um, to both have some capital to invest in something significant, but also choose how I spent my time and my energy. Um, and it wasn't as easy as that might think because I wanted to do something really meaningful. Um, my husband, Jeff, and I um, spoke a lot about what we might do and ever aware of the increasing climate crisis. Um, we thought at one point that we might buy land and we might plant trees and that was something we could, we could do. Um, but we didn't have any very like tangible plans for that. Um, but um, it actually uh, sort of a couple of, well, it was around that same time that I was bought uh, this book, Wilding by Isabella Tree. And, and I suppose probably many people who are listening to this will already be quite familiar with this book. Um, it's the account of how the Nep estate in Sussex was returned to nature um, and is still farmed, but it's taken a very, very different approach. And, and it was around that time that I was becoming increasingly aware, not just of the climate crisis, but actually the crisis in biodiversity and in nature. And this book had a huge impact on me um, because for the first time it, it, I was able to sort of understand, I suppose, how the British countryside that I'd been looking at wasn't necessarily the green and pleasant land that we'd understood it to be, but actually some of the problems that modern farming had, had left for nature. Um, but also I felt this book offered hope and it offered a solution and it offered an account of how th there'd been many successes on, on this estate. 
Now, we certainly weren't in a position to, um, to do something on the scale of NEP, um, but we were in a position to buy some farmland um, of a smaller scale, probably a typical, um, certainly English farm, and uh, if not British farm. And uh, that's exactly what we decided to do. But again, it was a plan for the future. Um, and then it comes down to timing, because around 18 months ago, we got in a conversation with uh, a neighbouring farmer. And this guy had run a dairy farm, for, it had been the, the family for several generations, typical upland farm. Um, and it had become increasingly difficult to run that dairy farm and, and to, to make any kind of money from it. And he decided that he, he'd come to the conclusion that he wanted to finish that and he wanted to sell a good portion of his land and, and sell his business. And it was a um, real uh, coincidence, I suppose, because it's not often, if ever, that a patch of land that you might be looking to buy comes up on your doorstep. And this land is adjacent to our house and a small meadow that we, we owned at the time. So without a deep plan um, and based on reading this book and a couple of others that followed from it, we decided to take the plunge and to buy uh, 120 acres of his farmland. And so around a year ago, um, we closed that and, and that's what happened. And that's the, the sort of the start of, of Sunart Field. So this map here shows you um, where, where we're based and gives you an impression of the land that we bought. Um, it's a bit of a strange shape because um, the farmer still owns the farmhouse and, and a few fields surrounding that. And we've bought all of the land that sort of um, uh, surrounds. You can see it makes a bit of a, a G shape in that um, uh, blue color in the, in the bottom right. It's a really, really interesting location. Uh, Whaley Bridge, where the land is, is, is just located just outside of there. We are both on the edge of the Peak District National Park and the high, we're very much in the high peak, but we're also within visual distance of Manchester town centre. So from the highest points of the land, you can both see Kinder Scout and the Kinder Plateau and the wilds of that moorland. You can look up the Goit Valley, which is a wonderful woodland owned by, partly by the Forestry Commission and um, the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and some utility companies. Uh, but you can also look over at the spires of Manchester and Stockport and you can really see the kind of urban connection. Um, so it's, it's really fascinating. Um, it's perhaps typical of an upland farm um, in its characteristics. Um, the land is not suitable for arable. It's very undulating. It's quite high up. The highest point is around uh, just over 300 metres. Um, and there's about a drop of, of over 130 metres across the span of the land. Um, and it actually used to be, before it was farmed for dairy, it used to be coal mined. So we have four coal shafts and a coal adit on the land. And at one point it would have been extremely industrial, serving coal to nearby industry and perhaps providing that to, uh, to the canal basin in, in Bucksworth to be moved towards Manchester and so on. So it's an extremely interesting piece of land. And we have a lot of neighbours. We've got around 40 neighbours that border our land with houses that's back gardens run adjacent to our land. Um, and so it's got particular characteristics that maybe you wouldn't find in a much more remote piece of land. So I'm going to show you some pictures of what the land looks like. And, and this picture was taken um, or more or less on completion. Um, large parts of the land are typical of what you might think as sort of green and pleasant countryside. Um, big pastures that were managed for dairy farming. Um, and what that meant is that many of the trees were removed, um, many of the scrub was, was grubbed out and removed. Um, the, the pastures have been ploughed and reseeded with a, usually a non-native ryegrass mix. Um, and they've been managed for the optimization of that grass, both for, for silage, but also for immediate grazing. Um, and so slurry was probably applied about twice a year. Um, it was the pesticides were used in the form of spot spraying. Um, and it's, it's a typical treatment that you'd find in these sorts of pastures. But what it means really is these kind of areas from an ecological perspective, as confirmed by recent surveys we've had done, are, are basically pretty much deserts. There's not a lot living there. There certainly wasn't at the start of, of taking this on. So it's not completely sparse, but um, you know, these are the areas which aren't as green and pleasant when you take a closer look as, as you might think. Um, but there's some wonderful parts too. 
Um, and, and this is um, really testament to the farmer having an appreciation for nature and leaving parts of the land um, to essentially go wild. And part of it is because tractor access is really difficult in certain parts. So you can see here, there's, there's a brook, one of three that we have that flows into a stream um, at the bottom of the land, um, which ultimately flows into the River Goit and then the River Mersey. So our land is on the, it's, it's, it's land that will flood and in, 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 certainly in the, in the valley. And so we're very conscious of that. Um, but there's also got these pockets of wonderful scrub and mature trees. And these are the areas that we really have observed the most life um, and the most diversity in terms of wildlife. I wanted to show this picture as well, because this is quite a steep slope where it was really difficult for the farmer to um, access with a tractor. And so consequently, it's been left. And what you see here are natural tree nurseries. And Isabella Tree talks about this in her book, where essentially the scrub starts to form, tree seeds are wind blown, um, they provide, the scrub provides protection from uh, grazers eating the saplings, and so they can get away. And you can see that's how mature trees can start to form in amongst this, this, these pastures. Um, and so on these steeper parts, we've got a really wonderful scrub foundation. Um, this area here is actually a, a copse which we inherited, um, which um, was originally, looking at old maps, a, a broadleaf plantation, which was clear felled. The stumps were left intact, so some of them have regrown, uh, but it was planted up with lodgepole pine. Uh, probably for, for timber and, and, and perhaps tax breaks at the time, um, but it's now end of life. And those, those uh, trees are starting to die and fall in on themselves. And the more that do that, the more the, the weaker it becomes. Um, and so consequently, it's very, very wild. It's got a very dense understory. And from a recent animal camera that we had up there, we know we've got some incredible life. We've got a badger, a female badger with cubs at the moment. Um, we've seen a woodcock on camera, foxes, hares, rabbits and all kinds of bird life. This is worth pointing out, this is our wildflower meadow, and, and, and this was a sort of two acre field which we owned before we bought the, uh, the, the larger section of land. Um, and we reseeded this as a wildflower meadow. It's got a really great mix in there. Um, this will be its um, fourth, third, third year of operation, and uh, it's really starting to do, do very well. But it, it's, it's very important, I'll talk more about this later, because this is providing a really useful seed bank that we can start to use on other parts of the land. So why are we doing this? What is this motivation and for, for sort of taking this extreme kind of pivot in, into this, this area? Um, well, I think we probably all recognize we're in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. Uh, I was really struck by the State of Nature report, which was published a couple of years ago, which really kind of calls out the extent to which species have declined over the last 50 years. Indeed, 15% of species are, are threatened with extinction in Great Britain. Um, of the sort of eight and a half thousand species that were surveyed. And, and really probably more concerning are the number of populations that are under, that are decreasing, have decreased over that time. So 41% of sort of significant species have decreased. Um, it's not all bad news, but I think increasingly we're just looking at graphs of declining species, whether it's in Britain or globally. And it's hugely concerning. Um, and really that concern is because, you know, our human civilization absolutely depends on our ecosystems. It depends on services that we don't fully understand and are fundamental to our food sources, to our climate and to our, our sort of well-being. And getting more specific on that, I think, you know, the recent um, sort of COVID crisis and, and, and the research that's followed has shown just how important nature is and access to uh, wild places, not just countryside, but wild places has for our mental health and well-being. Um, it's hugely important, particularly in the uplands, for um, in, in the face of changing climate and increasing storms and um, flash floods, flood mitigation and, and the benefits that the uplands can provide to helping with water management. Of course, air quality, ecosystems help to clean our air and provide us with oxygen um, as well as to, to sort of take in carbon dioxide and so on. Um, but I think really importantly is if when we think about the soils and our soil health, uh, the, the sort of future of medicine partly resides in, in, in discovery of new drugs and antibiotics in the soils 
Um, famously, penicillin was discovered in soil, but a couple of years ago, there was a huge discovery of a lot more antibiotics in soil. And so it's really important for us not to, to sort of recognize the value and recognize that we don't understand a lot of it yet. Um, and not least the complexities and the beauty of nature. Um, I, I think um, a lot of people are feeling much more compelled to take a part in protecting that. So by no means am I suggesting that our little park can, can really help to influence all of this. But I think it's just feeling that we are doing something um, to be part of a global movement, which is, which is heading in the right direction to tackle some of these problems. And I think, you know, one of the other things that came out of the State of, State of Nature report is just how much modern agriculture, and by that I mean intensification, um, the effect that has had upon nature in particular, not least because a large portion of our land in Britain is, is managed for agriculture. And as, through modern farming, we've lost a number of the really important habitats that are fundamental to broader ecosystems. We've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows, which appreciably were farmland, but they were working in tandem with nature and supported a great deal of species. We've lost half of our ancient woodland and trees. Um, we've lost huge portions of scrubland, this really important scrubland, as well as the mature hedgerows that would have provided di a division between um, farm boundaries, but also acted as really important corridors for nature and, and habitat. And so I think, you know, the, one of the motivations for us was to say, well, let's take a patch of land which has had modern farming treatment and just see what we can do there. Um, and, and significantly, our land is probably typical of, of the size of a lot of British farms. And so I think there's learning to be had from the scale we're doing it, as well as the scale that can happen at, at sort of in larger states that we see as well. But the good news is, I suppose it's the good news, but it's certainly the reality that farming is changing. Um, and that's not least because we find ourselves in a situation of, of Brexit taking place. And, and regardless of your feeling on that, um, it's, had a, it's having a big knock on effect for farming. So the common agricultural policy, which was um, uh, very much part of us being in the European Union, but of course there were subsidies prior to that. So it's not just as a result of Europe, but nevertheless, the common agricultural policy is coming to an end. Um, and one of the big things that's coming to end is the basic payment system. So that's the system by which farmers and landowners are paid per acre of land that they own. And that's gonna have a huge knock on effect. Um, contrary to popular belief, um, it, it's not necessarily a big income for most farmers. And um, certainly in the Peak District, uh, the, the sort of average farmer takes away between five and 10,000 pounds across their farm from the basic payment system. Um, but that can mean the difference between profit and loss or between viability and not um, for a farming approach. And so it's having a, a, a big change, the fact that base, the basic payment system is going uh, and the government is moving towards a new system called ELMS or environmental, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, um, where really they're trying to incentivize public money for public goods. So that is, um, there's a huge amount of, of sort of different um, and positive aspects about land treatment for the environment within that. So that change is taking place over the next seven years. Um, and there's a transition. So uh, there's something called the Sustainable Farming Incentive, which is, is being offered as a part of that transition. But nevertheless, we're going to see, and we are seeing farmers, some farmers are already moving um, and some are contemplating what this means for, for their model. Um, the other thing to, to recognize is that uh, it's a really important year for biodiversity and, and Britain's place. Um, so there's the Biodiversity Summit, the UN Summit in May. Uh, we are hosting COP26 in, in the autumn. And Britain really want to make a stand in terms of where, where they sit with in, in terms of sort of rewarding an environmental policy. Um, the, there's a new environmental bill, which will hopefully come into place um, in a few months time. Uh, it's not in place just yet. But one of the things that includes is something um, called biodiversity net gain. Um, and that is where developers will be required to offset any habitat loss on their site, plus 10%. If they can't do it on their own site, they will be required to buy credits somewhere else. And so what that means is there is a market for habitat provision um, and development. And whatever your feelings about development taking place or not, 
it, the fact is it is taking place and, and requiring developers to um, place a financial value on that certainly does cause them to sit up and listen. But it also means there's a viable market, if you like, for, like, for offering up those habitats. So that's something that a lot of landowners and farmers are starting to look at. And I think the other thing I'd like to mention is that um, the average age of a farmer in, in Britain is 59. Um, and so we inherently have a situation where there will be farmers retiring um, and new farmers, new landowners um, coming in who may take a different approach. And so whatever your feelings on that dynamic, it's going to be a really interesting seven years um, in particular whilst we watch these changes play out. So I just wanted to quickly, this talk isn't about the um, uh, sort of fully about the principles of rewilding because I could talk for an hour about that, but I did want to touch on um, you know, what is meant by rewilding and then how is that applicable to what we're doing. Um, so this is the, um, the definition of rewilding as, as per Rewilding Britain's website. Um, and a disclaimer here, I've recently taken a, a, a board position as a, as a trustee for Rewilding Britain. So I am getting much more familiar with, um, with how Rewilding Britain thinks about, about this definition and, and where it extends. But what they really talk about here is large scale restoration of ecosystems. So that's landscape scale change um, and to allowing nature really to start to take care of itself. So that's reinstating natural processes. In some cases, it's bringing natural species in. And in some cases, it is intervention to enable um, nature to have the best chance. So it's easy to look at this and think, well, that's only applicable if you own uh, three and a half thousand acres as NEP do or several thousand acres um, in the Scottish Highlands. Um, that can't be applicable to farmland like ours um, or indeed to smaller plots. But actually, landscape scale change can be achieved by connecting different landowners together, taking a similar approach to allow connectivity of nature. And so we very much see what we're doing is fitting into landscape scale change by teaming up with other landowners, um, some of whom may own 10 acres, some may have back gardens and others might be larger estates. But joining up these connected lands that allow certain ecosystem processes to take place, whether that's birds that are able to find the right food source and move between habitats, whether it's mammals moving between connected portions of land, or whether it's to considering the watercourses that run between these portions of land. So that's all really important and achievable, actually, regardless of land ownership. It's about cooperation. And we're already seeing some really exciting stuff happening in Whaley Bridge um, around that kind of connection. The other thing is, people often think rewarding is about land abandonment and it's about taking people out of nature. And it very much isn't that. We are part of the ecosystem and it's about considering how we behave, how we operate within those ecosystems and the role that we play. Um, so in some cases that might be um, humans actually playing the part of um, missing species. So unfortunately, uh, we don't yet have the, the, the wolf in and around the Peak District, which can um, control the numbers of grazers. So that's something that we're going to have to do as humans to mimic the process that, that uh, natural apex predators um, would form in the wild. Um, and the other thing is, um, land, particularly ours, has been intervened with. So what we what what is important is perhaps to um, is to in reverse intervene to undo some of those processes to allow a great baseline for nature's and natural processes to start to take hold. And I really like this definition. So this comes from David Attenborough's book, A Life on Our Planet. And he talks about a wildland farm. And I suppose this is really, um, you know, what we aspire to, um, where it's a rewilding approach to farming in which livestock mimics the natural um, community of, of certain animals. So, you know, instead of having the sort of wild ox or bison roaming about our land, we will have um, native um, herbivores which we will manage to, to form um, a similar kind of grazing process. Um, we won't yet have wild boar running through the land. Uh, we've got a lot of footpaths and we've got to consider the uh, interaction between people and uh, their dogs and, uh, and sort of the animals that we keep. Um, but in the meantime, in the absence of wild boar, we've got pigs and they're performing that same process. 
So it's really thinking about um, using livestock to mimic natural processes, but it's very much thinking about the numbers, the density which we keep those animals so that they're suiting the carrying capacity of the land. Um, traditionally, we'd probably maximise, and certainly in modern farming, we'd maximise the domestic animal or crop output. Whereas this is really flipping the thinking and it's, it's considering what is appropriate for the size of the land and the landscape. So this is what we, we are as, aspiring towards. And the really exciting thing is where we're located. Um, we are within uh, something called the Wild Peak Initiative, which is a, a landscape scale change initiative through the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and Rewilding Britain um, to take this really connected approach to actually restoring ecosystems. Um, we are that little um, red um, star that you can see um, more or less in the centre of the map. Um, so we are interestingly in an urban connection zone uh, and that's really important and I'll talk more about how we're going to incorporate that later. So um, looking at our time frame, I tend to think about what we're doing in three phases. Um, so we, we are in a phase currently of quite a high degree of intervention to undo certain treatments on the land that had happened previously um, and to set in place a really good baseline. And, and we kind of see this as sort of three to five years of, of, of much more intervention um, to get to a point where um, more of the natural processes and the sort of habitats can get established and we can see the return of certain species. And that may involve species reintroduction. Um, it may involve um, um, some further intervention to kind of optimize the habitats. But beyond that, we really hope to see a sort of period of maturity. And that might be 15, 20 years plus, but really where we start to take a back seat and we really allow nature to be the predominant force in terms of what we're doing. And um, this, I like this picture, this shows the sort of Nepa state. Um, I think this is about a difference of about five years between their kind of typical um, farmland pastures and, and what the result was um, after taking a rewilding approach. Um, and this left hand picture is, is very similar to what you see with aerial pictures um, uh, from our farm, albeit it's a bit more undulating here. Um, so really we're hoping in that sort of, um, you know, perhaps that middle stage, we'll start to see these sorts of results and we'll start to see the land looking very different. But let's start with some practicalities. So let's talk about the intervention phase and what we've been doing over the past year to um, practically get stuck in and to, 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 to kind of work on the land. Um, this picture shows uh, on the left, uh, one of the most uh, sort of manual tasks we've been doing is to clean up the land. We've taken about um, three skips of rubbish, including the proverbial shopping trolley we found in, the, in one of the brooks, which is the most unlikely place you would find a shopping trolley. And I now believe you found them, you do indeed find them in every watercourse in Britain. Um, but yeah, I mean, the land we took on, it, it looked, it, and, and it, met, it really was quite well looked after, but nevertheless, there's been an awful lot of rubbish that we have pulled out and tried to clear out and keep on top of. Um, this vehicle here is our, our only um, kind of big capital expenditure. Um, it's a Kawasaki Mule, it's a four by four, and it really allows us to do most of the tasks that we need to. On the left-hand side, you'll see some walling that we've done. We're becoming uh, increasingly, um, uh, proficient, I wouldn't say expert, we're becoming, becoming proficient wallers. Um, we have a lot of boundary walls. Um, and as I said, they, uh, we have a lot of neighbours with back gardens whose land adjoins ours. And we've got an obligation to make sure that our livestock doesn't get into their gardens and that those boundaries are retained intact. So in some of that case, it's through dry stone walling. In other cases, it's through um, putting in um, sort of livestock um, proof fencing. So we've had to do quite a lot of work just to make, make sure the boundaries are intact from the off. We've also done a lot of baseline surveys. So it's really important to us to get data from the beginning if we can prove what we're doing is, um, is having an impact. Uh, so we've taken soil surveys. So what you can see in the center here is an auger and, uh, and uh, sort of bag of soil. And so we've got some amazing soil surveys. Uh, we've got the traditional type, but also um, as shown in this kind of the pictures at the bottom, um, we've teamed up um, with an organization called Fields Forever that's helped us to map our microbial um, uh, communities. So we've had sort of DNA sampling done on our soil samples to sort of say, well, what is living in the soil at the moment? And, and so we're hoping to track that over time to see how that changes. In the top right, you can see this, this device here is called an audio moth and it's taking sound samples. 
um, in a couple of parts of the land. Um, so we can understand how the audio climate is changing and, and we can help, um, people can help us to um, actually detect what species are residing now and, and how that changes over time. And we've been working with a couple of people at Manchester Met University to, to help us with that. And we've also done some traditional surveys. We've worked with the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust to take a look at what's living there. Uh, we've had a lot of animal cameras up and we've seen some amazing things. It's, it, we really do have a, a reasonable, a really good foundation, particularly in these wilder areas. Um, so we've got some, uh, some wonderful species um, of flowers. We've got some orchids. That's the common spotted orchid that you can see. Uh, we've got in the bottom picture, that blue flower you can see is the sheep's bit scabies. Um, so uh, that's quite an unusual record apparently for Derbyshire. And we have quite a lot of that on the land. And we've got the kind of the ragged robin and, uh, and that's just, we've seen this just through letting the grass grow and, and, and these have just appeared and, and bloomed. And uh, we've also got, um, we've got uh, a number of um, moths. There's a cinnabar moth there and butterflies. Um, and fantastically, we've got breeding hares, several pairs that we regularly see on the land. And we have badgers, um, some already residing there uh, and some more now as a result of what we've, we've done. One of the problems that we have, this picture shows Himalayan balsam, and it's about the only invasive species that we'll probably take out of the land um, because it's non-native and it really swamps the watercourses. Um, so one of the things we did was to start to tackle that this year, but really also just to get a sense of the extent of it, which we have. And we're really keen to do more to, uh, to tackle that going forward. And massively importantly, one of the things we've done is to... Um, engage with people who live locally and want to get involved with what we're doing with planting. Um, we've had a, a huge number of people donate saplings that they didn't want growing in their garden or that they've saved from places, um, bring them to us. And then we've worked with, with, with a huge team of people to actually get these in the ground. Um, and additionally, um, which came as an opportunity through the Wildlife Trust kind of around December time, uh, we've been able to source um, a lot of hedge plants. And as of uh, this week, as of Friday, we will have planted um, 1.4 kilometres of hedging, which lines the public footpaths that cross our land, providing a wonderful green corridor for wildlife, but also for people to enjoy. As these start to bloom um, and grow, then a lot of them, there's a huge diverse mix. We've got a lot which are um, fruiting, so they'll provide a source of food for mammals and, and uh, walking humans alike. Um, and rather than boxing in the footpaths, we've taken an approach to say, let's make the footpaths more obvious. One of the first things we did was put in these uh, yellow signs and uh, with, with a few footpath signs uh, just to show people where, where the footpaths are, to help people to stick to the footpaths, but to make them a really pleasant experience. Uh, they're really wide. Instead of the legal one metre width, they're about four or five metres in places. So they make wonderful avenues. And, um, and it also helps us to, uh, to kind of manage the interaction between people and dogs and allowing areas um, just to be kept for nature without a kind of high impact. And at this point, I just really wanted to say thank you to all the people, some of are on this call tonight, I know, um, who have got involved with this planting. We've been able to do it safely during COVID by giving people a 10 metre stretch of hedging each to work on on themselves or, or in a bubble. And together, through this team effort, we've achieved something that Jeff and I certainly couldn't have achieved by ourselves. And something we've also done is to make some early reintroductions. Uh, we had uh, an abandoned badger set. And so uh, we've had it surveyed by the Badger Trust. Uh, they found that there were no badgers residing there. And so we've been able to rehome um, five rescue badger cubs and they have um, taken up in there in the picture. Two of them are in the picture on the bottom right um, and they are doing phenomenally. Um, we're really pleased. They've been joined by another bad roaming badger who's moved in with them. Um, and so we have six badgers residing in that set. We've also built with the Badger Trust, uh, they've built, we've, uh, we've kind of helped to give them the spot, uh, an artificial badger set where we could rehome some more badgers um, in time. Um, but actually on doing this, we discovered um, that we have this female badger and her cubs residing very near. Uh, so it might be that we've just built a residence for, for when they grow up and, and need to move in. 
And the other thing, a very simple thing we've done is to let the grass grow long. So this aerial picture um, is taken um, very recently um, by a wonderful guy called Andy, who's uh, based in, um, in, in Chorlton. And he's very kindly given his time to, to get some great drone footage for us. And you can see the, the line between um, the farmland on the, on the left and ours on the right. And this is taken in wintertime, but already you can see a bit of a difference um, between the sort of species that you see there, the length of the grass. And, and what does that mean? Well, even over the course of a few months, we have seen the return of um, uh, at least a, one pair of breeding barn owls. And at one point you could go out at dawn or dusk and reliably see this barn owl captured um, hunting. And these pictures were taken by a local photographer, um, Edward Dalton, who uh, walks the, the land regularly. And he's captured these wonderful pictures of our, our barn owls. And in the center, you can see a buzzard. We've got um, nesting buzzards and um, they are almost every day seen flying around the land. And uh, for the barn owls in particular, the long grass has meant wonderful habitat already for voles and mice, and they are just finding what they need to, uh, to eat. And so it's amazing how quickly that can happen. And meet our pigs. So these two, uh, these two pigs, they're two, we did have four, we've now got two, two have gone off uh, for meat. Um, we've now got two and there'll be two more piglets on the way. And what they're doing is providing a really important role as, as tools, they are tools on the land, um, to really uh, move about these pastures and weaken the ryegrass, exposing parts of, of soil uh, for windblown seeds to form, um, and but also we've done an awful lot of scattering of green hay in parts of, of from, from the wildfire meadow in, in some of these parts. So what we're hoping is that over time through this treatment, we will start to weaken the ryegrass. We will start to see more native grasses coming in and we will start to see the return of the grasslands to a much more kind of organic and, and natural mix. And I think it's really phenomenal to look at um, one of Andy's pictures from above here. This shows you a field um, where there were two pigs operating for just a few months. And this is the extent of work that they've done. They've turned over more than half of the land. Um, and unlike ploughing, they don't turn over deeply. They just turn over the flip over the top layer of turf. Um, and that really starts to weaken what's there because quite simply they're eating the roots of, of, of what's living there as well as the grubs and things. So it's really phenomenal to watch them at work. And as far as we know, this approach isn't widely taken. Um, we were advised by a lot of people when we took on the land that we should spray, we should um, potentially think about ploughing to get rid of the, the ryegrass and stuff that was there, but we weren't keen to do that. So this is very much an experiment to see whether this approach works. And here we can see, um, this is the cut of the wildflower meadow. Um, we didn't have, it was cut by a neighbouring farmer, but we had to gather this hay up by hand. Uh, the picture on the right shows Jeff um, in the trailer with a, with a trailer load of hay. Uh, I was driving at this point. So we would literally load up the hay from the meadow, drive it to the area the pigs had overturned and scatter it by hand in the patches of exposed soil. Um, and as I said, it was an experiment. It was uh, something, it was pretty tiring work that, but uh, I'm, I'm glad we got it done so we can actually see, see what will, will change. Um, so yeah, I just wanna talk now, and, I, and this is kind of the final section, really about our economic model because it's really important to us uh, that what we do is sustainable from an economic point of view. Um, not least because if we're gonna spend our time doing this, um, we need to at least cover our costs, but also because we need to demonstrate that this is a viable way to run this type of land in Britain. And so what we're hoping is through running Sunot Fields and through testing out some of these approaches, that actually potentially there can be lessons learned that we can uh, to sort of pass on to others in a, in, a, in a similar position. And so our economic model works through two prongs. I mean, one is a very low cost base. As I said, this mule is our major outgoing and um, we try to be really conscious of any capital outgoings. So getting anything done that involves a tractor would be a great expense to us, which is, uh, it puts a good break on certain approaches actually. Um, but the second thing is we're taking a portfolio approach to revenue. And so we're trying out a number of strands, some of which may be fruitful and some of which may not. But it's really important to us to um, uh, to learn and and sort of uh, find information and talk to people and, and, and try out different strands. One of which is very much um, through kind of government uh, incentives. 
And this is the sort of public money for public goods that, that Elms talks about. Um, Elms isn't in place at the moment. Uh, we're heading in that direction and the governments are kind of starting to sort of publish more and more information about what they will entail. But it's still pretty vague on what it actually means in, in, in financial terms. So in the meantime, we are applying for the higher tier countryside stewardship. Um, we're having some great conversations with Natural England about what we're doing and how that might be eligible for funding under the higher tier um, prior to, to ELMS coming about. And that certainly wouldn't subsidise what we're doing fully, but it would provide um, some income. And it's, it's um, important that um, we look at what the government are wanting um, from the treatment of land and, and how we might fit in with that. The SFI is something called the Sustainable Farming Incentive. And this is something which is being offered to farmers um, as a transition between a basic payment system and ELMS. And so that's something that we're sort of keeping our eye on as well. I talked a little bit earlier about biodiversity net gain. Um, we are a part of a, a Natural England pilot scheme uh, for biodiversity net gain. We're one of 10 projects across the UK um, that are basically have had our land surveyed for the types of habitats we have just now and the types of habitats we could support. Um, they are trialing a biodiversity metric for evaluating the value of those habitats. And biodiversity net gain would mean effectively uh, locking in parts of the land for particular habitats for 35 years. And the treatment of that land may come under some quite strict guidelines. So we're very much weighing up um, you know, how that sits along rewilding, what is practical for us in 35 years when we'll be in our 70s, and, you know, what kind of management we can commit to. And that's some of the feedback we're kind of giving to Natural England as part of the scheme is it's very important to kind of consider all of that, as well as just simply the cost that you're getting per acre. We have looked deeply at carbon offsetting. We had a successful woodland creation grants um, awarded by um, the Forestry Commission. Uh, for planting 40,000 trees. Uh, and we decided not to take that up um, because when we got to the bottom of it, uh, we would have probably been about 35,000 pounds out of pocket just simply for um, working with that scheme. So it's a bit of a myth that these schemes kind of cover the costs. And frankly, that's something that we weren't prepared to do. So we've taken a different approach to, 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 to getting some of the trees in the ground um, and a slower approach perhaps. And maybe that will work out for the better. But as part of that application, we also uh, were successful with the government's um, woodland create a carbon guarantee scheme, where basically the, uh, the government are committing to buy your carbon for a particular price in terms of stimulating a carbon offsetting market. Um, and of course, we'd be free to sell carbon on the private market. Um, but again, that scheme in practice, um, Really, the market isn't there for it just yet in financial terms. Um, uh, by committing more than half of our land um, for sort of 30 to 50 years, uh, we'd probably make an income of about £3,000 a year from that, that offsetting. Um, and I think it's really difficult to ask farmers to, to go down that path because that doesn't even include costs. The, land, the, the, the trees have to be surveyed at your own cost. So it's very marginal as to whether that's a worthwhile thing to do. So we're looking at other strands as well. Um, one of these is complementary um, farming produce. So things that we can do, which uh, are sort of work well alongside our model, um, but um, also don't adjust it significantly. One of those is wild range meat. We have taken two of our pigs um, to market and, or rather to not to market, to the abattoir. Uh, we had to see that through, which is a really um, sort of quite, uh, foundational moment to decide to do that and then to sell that meat um, uh, to 23 families in total and um, it's it was beautiful meat it's wild range it's very lean and because we actually have been able to feed our pigs um, on a fifth of the uh, sort of diet of commercial feed they would normally get the rest of the food they're getting from the land so it's a really different quality of meat and of course it's it's organic as well um, these pictures uh, also show something we came across which is working with local florists to provide sustainable foliage and flowers at the right time of year so we're working with uh, three florists and there's some beautiful pictures here from the flower fox in Hayfield um, of some wreaths that they a wreath they've made with our, our foliage over Christmas and some bouquets they make as well. 
education is a huge part of what we want to do. Um, we are working with the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. They've got some funding on something called the Green Recovery Fund. And um, some of that is going towards putting in place some nature school facilities on our land. So very simple tree based canopies, some uh, compost toilet, some simple uh, log bases uh, and some animal viewing hides, as well as some um, other things like bird boxes. And uh, starting in around a month, we'll be welcoming the local rainbows and guides to start using the site. Um, and we're also talking with a forest school group who are very keen to start sessions thereafter. Um, a wonderful person who um, runs yoga and mindfulness for children, getting them outside in nature um, and also um, sort of art and, um, and getting them to sort of spend time drawing natural scenes. Uh, and so our model really is not to offer those courses ourselves, but to work with others who are experts in doing that and have the sort of provision to, to welcome them in, and, and allow them to, to use the space. And as the land starts to mature, and as we start to see more nature residing, more species of birds and mammals, then the opportunities to offer education, both to adults and children alike, um, starts to grow. And so we're really looking forward to expanding what we do there. And finally, um, one of the things we're also doing in some cases is to crowdfund for some specific projects. Uh, we were taken by surprise by a wonderful donation um, from somebody who just wanted to support what we're doing. And we put that towards something really tangible. You can see in the middle there, that's an owl box, barn owl box, uh, which is supplied by peak boxes. And so when it comes to things like that, um, we're really keen to put any funds into very specific, um, tangible things we can do to really augment the project. So that really brings me to the end of my, uh, my talk. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, obviously, as I said, it's very much work in progress. So what I've presented here is where we're up to, our way of thinking, um, but this is an ongoing story. Um, so I'd really encourage you to get in touch, um, to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at Sunart Fields. Um, and of course, I'm really open to taking questions now. I know we've got a bit of time reserved for that. Um, so thank you. And uh, Rachel, I think you're probably going to help to pick out a few questions uh, if we've, we've got. <laughs> sorry, I, I think, <laughs> sorry, Rachel, I think, think I've just managed to um, mess up the muting. Um, thank you so much for that talk. It was really, really fantastic. Um, and, and again, it just strikes me how much you've been doing um, and also how, how much there is to navigate through. Um, so I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Um, but also for people who are watching on the live stream, um, if people want to um, put questions into the chat, um, we're monitoring that as well. So we can bring some questions in for that. Um, but if people would like to ask questions, please remember to unmute yourself. Um, Rachel, perhaps if you could unshare your screen and then I get a, a better view as well, and then we can both watch out for who wants to ask questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask questions, if you remember to unmute yourself, um, either wave your hand about or use the little symbol from the bottom of the screen. Um, yeah. Can I ask one, please? Yes, yeah, Sheila, go ahead. Yeah, I was very interested, you know, in, in cutting the, uh, the hay and spreading it on, onto where the pigs had been foraging. I think that will work really well. I just wondered if there was any possibility that, uh, that, that Rachel, would it be financially viable to um, maybe, uh, you'd need a baler, of course, I suppose, um, to sell that um, to other landowners who are doing similar projects. And also, again, I think you'd need a tractor um, of possibly um, growing uh, oats or barley in, in one of the fields that I presume you could feed to the pigs. Um, and of, of course, the, 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 the chaff and the fallen grain would, would uh, do well to increase the number of voles and mice. So that's it. Thanks, Sheila. Yeah, absolutely. No, they're really good points. And um, yeah, at the moment, in terms of the sort of size of our meadow and the, the crop, I suppose, that you get from that, then we are going to be using that on um, uh, 
sort of spreading on our fields as the pigs move around and we mm-hmm. probably um, will need to use that um, and you know it's although there's a reasonable volume of it it doesn't go very far when it comes to sort of spreading it out um, but in the fullness of time as hopefully these um, grass mixes and, and uh, start to take place um, in other pastures then that could become an option um, mm-hmm. to do some cutting and um, some provision uh, locally um, the other thing we've talked about with Natural England, which we may well go forward with, is actually bringing in some um, additional green hay or, or, or seeds from, um, from other parts so, uh, locally, so we can help to introduce that mix as well. And one, of the, one of the big bits of kit actually we need is a seed harvester, so rather than that will save us time instead of um, um, actually taking the green hay and all the weight of that, moving that round, is actually just to harvest the seeds and, and, and uh, and spread those. Um, so we're in discussion with, um, hopefully we might be able to borrow one um, mm-hmm. to, to sort of help with that in the short term. And I really like the idea of, of the kind of oats and barley. It's not something that we've considered, um, but yeah, why not? We'll, we'll take a look at that. So thanks for that tip. Thanks very much. Okay, next question. I've got one from Wendy Burks on the uh, chat line here for the video. Picture. Saying, um, what would you say, <coughs> yes, I've got to read it from here. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to vegan campaigners who believe the answer to ecological problems is for us all to stop eating meat? I think your plan makes a lot of sense, but I've had trouble convincing vegan advocates that extensive grazing and harvesting farming livestock will play a big part in addressing uh, environmental issues. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, so I think our view is that it is not to um, to sort of take an extreme view, but actually just to think that as a as a human population, I think it's well recognised that we probably all need to to eat less meat, um, and you know that's the only way that we can uh, sort of exist viably. Um, and whether we'll move to a position where we're not eating meat at all in the future, may, maybe that will happen. Um, in the meantime, um, our pigs are predominantly and pigs, and we do have uh, we do have a few sheep. Um, so that we had those previously, um, and they're just in very low density. We've only got six, so they're not doing doing much. But we do actually take them for for mutton as well, um, uh, sort of once a year. Um, so our our view really is that uh, we're a, we're a while away from um, the whole of the human population being vegan or indeed vegetarian. And in the meantime, um, our pigs uh, in particular are acting as tools on the land and they are um, they live a long life. We, we keep them for over a year, which is uh, uh, much, much longer than they would um, get if they were sort of um, farmed specifically for their meat. Um, and that actually um, it's a reasonable thing to take their, their produce and to supply those to people who would be buying meat from elsewhere. Um, so that's our approach. Uh, it's very low density. Um, so we are talking at the moment, um, as I said, sort of four pigs over um, 120 acres. So it's very, very different um, order of magnitude than you might see in commercial farms. And, and our positioning really is, is you know, we, we've got to consider there are lots of different viewpoints. There are lots of different competing needs. And so um, some of it is about compromise and edging towards the right solution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, can I ask a, a, a question on behalf of JJ? Um, or does he want to ask it himself? JJ, do you want to ask this? You need to unmute yourself. No. Um, I'll ask it on, on his behalf, Rachel. Um, sure. So JJ wanted to know um, whether you've thought of using horses um, instead of tractors on the land? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, at the moment, uh, we are avoiding using either. Um, using horses requires quite a big overhead. Um, if we were to start keeping horses and managing those horses, and, and it's a big investment of our time um, because we're, we're not um, knowledgeable in equestrian matters, um, but it might be that we could team up with someone locally. And we're absolutely not against that. Um, it seems like a, a, a really great approach, particularly if we have kind of more um, forestry activities in the future. Um, but at the moment, we're trying to stay, um, stay quite lean. 
um, and really try not to, to use tractors at all. Um, there's the other point, really, I suppose, about grazing horses. And, and naturally, we would have had um, um, sort of native horses grazing our land. Um, and so there might be a place for, uh, for, for one or two ponies that provide that. They graze differently to cows and to, to sheep or obviously to pigs. Um, and so in the fullness of time, maybe there's a role for a, a couple of ponies that, that um, sort of graze naturally as well. Um, but that's really one step at a time. And that's not something we're looking to do immediately. Um, we we may, may go that route in the future. Thank you. Um, Anne, Anne Oliver, I think you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, on one of your Instagram posts, there was a picture of Badger moving his tub that you take, got on your um, camera. Do you know why they were doing that? Because I thought they usually kept their tubs in the set until they were ready to leave. Apparently, according to, so we're working very closely with the um, High Peak um, Badger Group. They're very active um, in this area and also kind of very well respected uh, nationally as well. And according to the experts there, um, that's often quite natural behaviour for, for a mum to, to move their cubs from, from one part to the next. I'm not sure why they do that, but we did ask the same question. You know, is that, is that have we disturbed the habitat in some way by happening upon the set? And, you know, is the mum likely to be worried? Um, but according to their observations, um, that this isn't unusual behaviour. Um, and we've since got a, quite a lot of camera footage showing that mum really happily going in and out of um, of the uh, the sort of burrow, with, well, the set rather, with um, with sort of food and, and without um, the cub. So um, we haven't seen the evidence of uh, any harm that's come to the cubs, but we're going to we'll, we'll see in the fullness of time whether they emerge in the spring um, looking healthy as we hope. Thank you. Um, Derek Bodie, can you unmute yourself, Derek? Derek, you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. the right button. Um, <laughs> you've taken 102 acres of productive land for food out of production with what you're doing. You want to try to try and get to a stage where you're supporting much greater biodiversity. Do you see a model in the future of sustainable, economic, really viable food production with increased biodiversity, as we used to have a few years ago? But do the economics now work? So I think it's a very open question. Um, and it would be very, it's too early really to conclude that. As I said, we, we, we are um, trying a number of strands and really putting um, to the test um, the potential economic <laughs> model um, for, for running a piece of land in this manner. Um, the, the sort of point you made about um, a productive land for food, I would argue against that. I, I think the, this particular farm, which is perhaps indicative of a lot of upland farms, um, isn't suitable for arable um, it, it's got coal a coal seam running almost to its surface so it would be very very difficult to grow a very a productive crop um, albeit some things grow it's, it's just it wouldn't be very productive um, so sort of intensive sheep farming or, or, or dairy or beef farming are probably the only options but you know I, I think it's about a balance it's not saying that every piece of land in Britain needs to be used in this way there will be land which is much more productive uh, in, in sort of food terms um, and you know and rightfully we should we should um, dedicate that land for food production um, but where we're located the particular type of geography um, we need to dedicate some of our land for biodiversity for carbon capture um, we are one of the most the, the poorest countries in Europe in terms of our provision for these habitats for woodland cover and it's only right that we start to return some of the uh, some land and probably the best choice is in the uplands the type of land that, that we own. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Erica. Another question. Well, we've, we, we do have a couple from the live stream as well, so perhaps we yeah. could go to those. Well, the first one's a, <coughs> excuse me, a comment from Graham Burgess, who might be a neighbour of yours, saying that the economics of the different environmental schemes are by far the biggest barrier stopping conventional farmers from making bigger changes. So we'll be watching your progress with interest and hopes to copy some of your ideas on his farm in the future. So that's good news. 
yeah and I'd, I'd entirely agree with that I think there's the, the all the noises are in the right direction but there's still a lot of specifics that need to be worked out and I suppose where we've got an advantage is we're starting with a clean slate we haven't got a moving engine as it were that we've got to keep going whilst we're experimenting um, so that's very much um, uh, an advantage and absolutely you know be keen to share these things and I suppose the other thing to say is you know we are some of what we're doing is farming and some is land management and it's turning that land over to a different model than farming so the educational experiences are in complement to running a, a patch of rewilded land um, but we're not trying to maximize farming produce it's one of the strands that, that, that we're doing um, and by all means as we go forward I'm really happy to share learnings both positive and negative because it's not all a success story there are things that we're finding out as I said with the Woodland Creation Grant that when you get to the bottom of it don't stack up at least for our land, they don't. So um, we, we're joining up with um, the Rewilding Britons. They've got a network um, of landowners sort of who are sharing, you know, learnings like this. Um, so that's one route. Um, but equally, we are we're sort of sharing on Instagram and Twitter and through direct conversations as well. There's a question from Sue Rodriguez. So many thanks, Rachel. Fascinating talk. She is a member of the Incredible Edible in New Mill. What would you suggest for those of us undertaking gardening in small community spaces? <laughs> yeah, great question. And actually, we've got some of the uh, the wheat growing uh, in our garden. So New Mills are running a kind of community based initiative to see about people growing wheat and kind of pooling that. So that's quite interesting. Um, but what I would also what I would say really is that any patch of land, no matter how small, can play a really important role in terms of providing habitat, but also providing a piece in the jigsaw to landscape scale change. So even just letting a patch of grass grow long, letting some scrubs some brambles develop, some nettles, uh, dare I say it, ragwort, um, you know, these kind of species that we've typically banished from our gardens, but actually provide a fundamental role in ecosystems. Um, and we don't need to all do it across all of our land, across all of our gardens, but if everyone did something across some of their gardens, then it would start to really kind of add up to landscape scale change. And we're really seeing that in Whaley Bridge, people who are taking a common approach saying, actually, I'm into this too. And we're starting to build a bit of a map of people who are taking that approach. And lo and behold, when we start to map it, you see it's a much greater area than just our plot alone. So it's hugely important, no matter what scale. Thank you. Um, Peter Croft, um, would you like to unmute yourself, Peter? Thank uh, thanks for a great talk. And um, just thinking that, you know, in general, we're going to see let maybe less so, you know, fewer overseas holidays and and uh, more emphasis on the use of countryside as a as a resource for mental health promotion. Is it possible that uh, a, a place of your size could, in the future, support sort of ecologically viable? holiday residential and and uh, uh, short stay residential type of uh, um, facilities uh, both as a source of income and, and to provide those sorts of holidays or health resources yes I think we are we're seeing a shift already in that but if a forced shift really but I think it's going to be something that probably um, stays with us um, and uh, absolutely, there are more and more people that want to spend time in, in, in different parts of the UK in and amongst nature. Um, and so in the fullness of time, yes, that's something which could be an option, um, could be an option for us. Um, it's not something that we are um, jumping into immediately, not least because it requires a, a certain amount of, of, of time. Um, and it also requires a certain amount of habitat to actually exist and a proliferation of nature to exist before it's really a place that makes sense to sort of travel to and see um so yeah there's some of that already but um we're really keen kind of keen to get the fundamentals in place before we start doing that and for us involving the local community and local groups is is really the starting point um so we're really pleased to be working with the local guiding groups and and hopefully some local schools um and um and to start involving people that way and then broaden out from there as you know as we test the water and 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 think about the carrying capacity of the land as well um, because the other thing we have to think about is 
is how we tread on the land, as it were. Um, you know, it, it's really important to leave some areas um, that aren't sort of trodden upon. And I mean that literally um, frequently um, if we're going to give space to nature. And so it's really important for us to think about how we build up in tandem with building up um, the ecological health of the land. And so that's why we, we're not jumping into that model at this point. But at some point in the future, it could make sense. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think Dave's got a question. Yeah, thanks very much, Rachel. Brilliant talk. And uh, you know, I love your place. Um, firstly, what we're doing here is setting one of the foundations to be what we call good ancestors to our descendants. Uh, but, and although a lot of this will come in really a lot more quickly than we expect, it's a long term project. What do you think we might need to do to protect it in the long term and beyond our own lifetimes? Is there some form of covenanting on the sort of rewilded land we can put in place to help protect it and stop it being degraded again or <laughs> over industrial? Yeah, I mean, I think this very much is a long term project and it's quite strange to be putting together kind of project plans and aspirations that very much outlive us. Um, but I, I think the, the simple answer to that in my mind is to involve children, young people now, both in the journey in terms of, um, you know, the, the thinking that we're going along um, and how things are changing um, and quite simply getting them on the land and, and sort of experiencing, um, you know, what, what, what's there now and, and how that will change because they're the custodians of, of the future. And so without their involvement and blessing, no amount of kind of legal covenants will, will make any sense. Um, of course, you know, we're, we're sort of mindful of that in a certain sense, um, but really it's about um, educating the, the sort of, you know, really young children. So I'm, I'm doing a talk um, at a couple of primary schools um, over the next few weeks and so whilst I'm talking to to grown-ups uh, and, and sort of pitching at this level I'm also really keen to share these learnings and this journey with people who are four five six and so on um, so that really they can start to I suppose have some of the experience that I had as a child that that can really live with you and, and, and make you feel like you want to do more than um, you know, just earn a salary, but actually to, to contribute in, in other ways and, and think about the importance of our, 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 our landscape and, and ultimately our, our, our world, really. Can I just uh, ask another question? Um, I, I believe in the past that farmers were given a subsidy to keep sheep. And in, in my opinion, that was a disaster because there were too many sheep and lots of them on the uplands were basically left to suffer and die. Uh, and I think there was a lot of cruelty involved there. And I was talking to Jill Williamson the other day about various things. And we, I don't know how it came about, but we were talking about that it, it's time that we looked upon, I mean, there's a value for a cow and a bull and a pig and a sheep, market value mainly. But we thought that it's time uh, that the government maybe put a value on on wildlife and it sounds a bit daft but if they sort of said well each each animal or each each plant or each habitat has it has a specific value then people some people anyway might value it more because because it was given a monetary worth and certainly as far as developers and people are concerned who um who have in my opinion, destroyed some beautiful habitat around Wentbridge. Maybe, you know, it would give people pause to thought before they said, yes, you can go ahead and do that. So it was just a, one of the things that we were discussing the other day. And I just wondered what other people thought about that idea. Yeah, I think, Sheila, that really comes into the sort of biodiversity net gain and, the, and, and I suppose the government's thinking and the sort of the private market, which is establishing. So the biodiversity um, metric, which is associated mm -hmm. with that, it's on iteration three, I think, now in terms of, of, of put, placing a value on particular habitats. So starting to turn it into economic terms and, you know, whether or not um, you, you kind of agree with the principle of that. Um, I think, you know, that is how we, we sort of live in a capitalist system and, and, and that is that that there is a value placed on things. And that is certainly the way um, uh, the sort of government and, and private market is starting to move. 
Um, so there's a way to go yet before that that is commonplace. Um, I think the other area that there's a way to go is in terms of the carbon offsetting. We, we, we can kind of get our head around valuing carbon because it's in, in sort of it's kind of somehow easier to um, sort of place equations around and, and we've got kind of evidence to back those up. Um, but in terms of biodiversity offsetting as a whole and, and sort of applying that not just to developers, but um, perhaps to corporations and so on, um, you know, that, that, that may well take place in the future. Um, but it's quite sort of it's 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 very early in terms of the thinking. But, you know, it, things, things are certainly changing. Thank you. Rachel, thank you so much. I, I, I think um, we need to draw it to a conclusion because um, you've been really generous with your time and um, I'm conscious that we're now at um, 20 past eight and uh, we're going to move on to the AGM. Um, but I wonder if people could unmute themselves um, and perhaps we could give Rachel a, a really big round of applause for what's been a fantastic and fascinating talk. Thank you so much, Rachel. So thank you. Um, 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 if I could just say, um, what we'll do now is we will uh, take a break and the AGM will start at 8.30, so um, you'll have time to stretch your legs a bit, uh, get a drink perhaps and come back for 8.30. Okay. Um, and just before everybody goes, um, as I said at the beginning, that was the concluding talk for this season. Um, and we are back with our talks on the 16th of October, which it just sounds quite a long way away, but if, if the year goes at the speed the last one's just gone, I, I think we feel like we'll be back fairly soon. Um, and we kick off on that day, the 16th of October, with a, a talk on hedgehogs, um, which two weeks later is then followed by a talk on um, wildlife in village India and Nepal. So again, we're going to sort of have the changes from, from local to international to... Well, they uh, um, so thank you so much and thank you to everybody on live stream who's joined us as well. Um, uh, there will be a, a programme of summer site visits, we hope, but um, I'm just waiting to see what happens with the COVID restrictions before we go ahead and publicise that. But that will be publicised on our Facebook page and, and in all sorts of other places and um, members will get direct information about that too. Um, so thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for your support. Um, over this whole season of talks. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you perhaps back in 10 minutes uh, to join us for the AGM as well. So thank you very much and see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Rachel. Well, I'm not a member, so I'm going to leave. <laughs>